The delayed choice quantum eraser experiment was first proposed by Scully and Druhol in 1982 and experimentally demonstrated by researchers at the University of Maryland in 1999. The experiment was devised as a way to show how a quantum object like a photon can exhibit both particle-like or wave-like behavior depending on the availability of information about the particular slit through which a photon goes through in a double-slit experiment. According to the authors, the ingenuity of this particular setup lies in the ability to manipulate the interference pattern caused by the wave-like nature of the photon, making it vanish or reappear even after the photon has hit the screen. Unfortunately, it is this depiction what has led many to mistakenly infer that this result implies some sort of retrocausality or backwards-in-time communication. But as we will see in this video, this couldn't be further from the truth. So, to fully demystify the delayed choice quantum eraser, let's do a step-by-step -step description of all the different parts involved in this experiment. At its core, the setup consists of a variation of the double slit experiment. We have a source of individual particles, a plate with two slits, and for now, let's assume that right after the plate, we have a couple of lenses that simply route the two waves emerging from the top and bottom slits onto the screen, here labeled as D0. So in essence, this is identical to the double slit experiment we described in a previous video which will produce the buildup of an interference pattern as more and more particles hit the screen. All we've done so far is move the screen from being right in front of the plate to a different location. The first modification we're going to make is to replace the first lens with a beta barium borate crystal, or a BBO crystal for short. This crystal takes the incoming source photon waves from the slits and produces an entangled pair of photons through a process known as spontaneous parametric downconversion. One of the photons is directed towards the screen D0, just like we had before. Therefore, we will refer to it as the screen photon. The second photon is emitted in a different direction and carries information about which slit the source photon went through in the form of a superposition. This is sometimes referred to as the which path information so we will refer to this photon as the information photon. Now, a common misconception I've seen when explaining this experiment is the belief that there will still be a fringe pattern at the screen if we refrain from measuring the information photon, and that only performing a measurement that tells us which slit the source photon went through will destroy the interference. In this setup, if the information photon is detected at D4, we know it went through the top slit, if detected at D3, then it passed through the bottom slit. It is then claimed that if we were to delay the measurement of the information photon, allowing the screen photon to reach D0 first, its landing position will still be determined by the interference of its wave function. And once a measurement to find which slit the photon went through is performed, the landing location on the screen would have to retroactively change to a position determined by a single slit wave. This is because it is never possible to both know which slit a particle went through and simultaneously have it interfere with itself. Now, this description is entirely wrong. The mere action of generating an entangled pair of photons is enough to prevent the screen photon from interfering with itself. This is because when entanglement happens, both photons are fully described by a global wave function rather than by separate and independent quantum waves. A helpful perspective to grasp this idea is to recognize that, unlike the conventional double slit experiment where the waves emerging from the top and bottom slits directly interfere with each other, the creation of the entangled pair of photons in this scenario splits the waves from the top and bottom slits into two separate and isolated branches of the global wave function. It is as if these two waves now lived in two separate universes. As a matter of fact, some versions of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics explicitly assert that this is what's actually happening. Now, irrespective of what interpretation we adhere to, the mathematics that describe this problem are clear in that these two waves cannot interfere. The process of going from a wave function that can interfere with itself to one that can't is known as decoherence, 
which is what's happening here when we generate the pair of entangled photons. So in the end, what we have are these two separate branches of the global wave function traveling and reaching the screen, where the particle will be localized at a given spot. Now, by simply looking at the screen, we can't really tell with certainty which of these two waves determine the particle's location. Since the probability densities of the two single-slit wave functions overlap, there will be some probability associated with the particle having gone through the top slit or the bottom slit. If the particle was measured towards the left side of the screen, it is more likely it came from the top slit. If it is seen towards the right, it probably came from the bottom slit. If it is localized right in the middle, then it's equally likely it came from the top slit or the bottom slit. Now, if at this point the information photon hasn't been measured, then its wave function will still remain in a superposition of coming from the top slit or the bottom slit. But due to entanglement, its corresponding probability amplitudes are now determined by where in D0 the screen photon was localized. Therefore, it is the landing position on the screen what fully determines the probabilities of measuring the information photon at D3 or D4. So, what we always get at the screen is a non-interfering pattern similar to the one we see in the conventional double slit experiment where we measure which slit the particle went through, irrespective of what we do with the information photon. And if we do decide to measure the information photon, its probability of being detected at D3 or D4 will depend on the landing position at the screen Y0. Therefore, separating the hits on the screen based on the corresponding measurements at D3 and D4 allows us to see which slit the screen photon went through. Now, so far, we have described the least controversial part of this experiment. Let's now look at what happens when we add what is known as the quantum eraser. So now instead of having detectors D3 and D4 directly measure which slit the particle went through, we add a couple of reflecting mirrors to redirect the photon waves and an element known as a beam splitter, which either lets the photon go through or reflect back, each with 50% probability. Therefore, a photon associated with the top slit has equal probability of passing through the beam splitter and being detected at D1 or reflecting back to be detected at D2. And the same goes for the bottom slit photon. With 50% probability, it will pass through the beam splitter to be detected at D2, and with 50% probability, it will be reflected back towards D1. So in this configuration, the photons that we measure at detectors D1 and D2 could have come from the wave associated with the top slit or the bottom slit with equal probability. In other words, this setup scrambles the information about which slit the photon came through. Now, the typical claim here is that since now we can no longer tell which slit the particle went through, the interference on the screen reappears. But as we mentioned before, this is simply not true. As we previously discussed, no matter what we do to the information photon, we will never see an interference pattern on the screen. However, the data does reveal something extremely interesting. If we selectively show on the screen only the particles correlated with the photons detected on D1, we do see what seems to be some sort of interference. Similarly, the screen photons associated with detections at D2 form a complementary set of bands. So how can this be? If all the eraser does is scramble the which path information how can the information photon entangle with a screen photon that lands in, for example, these regions, not that it should never be directed to detector D2? Well, it turns out that even though it is correct that the setup scrambles the slit information, that is not the full story. This particular configuration actually does quite a bit more than just that. Recall how we mentioned that once the screen photon gets localized at some point in D0, the information photon will still carry the probability amplitudes of having gone through the top slit or the bottom slit associated with that particular location. Furthermore, the relative phase of these two paths also changes depending on the location of the screen. So what the beam splitter really does is combine the incoming probability waves of the information photon 
causing constructive and destructive interference towards detectors D1 and D2 that depends on where on the screen the photon was localized. And since the beam splitter adds different relative phase shifts between the transmitted and reflected signals towards D1 and D2, the interference results we see are complementary. So what we have here isn't really an eraser, but rather an interferometer. If we would have chosen to scramble the witch path information in a different way, by let's say randomly allowing one of these two branches to be sent to detectors D1 and D2, then the particles on the screen associated what we measure with D1 and D2 will not show any type of periodicity or correlation. The pattern will be completely gone. So where most explanations of the delayed choice quantum eraser fail is in recognizing that the information photon is also part of the superposition of probability waves that can interfere with each other, rather than just a mere localized particle with separate witch path probabilities. Now, in the complete version of this experiment, there is also an additional pair of beam splitters that either direct the information photon to the witch path detectors D3 and D4, or allow the photon to pass through the eraser. But all this really do is allow for both of the scenarios we already explained to take place. So at the end, we end up with particles on the screen that never show an interference pattern, but that when are separately plotted based on which detector their partner information photon triggered, result in the four different patterns we described. Now, in the remaining part of this video, we'll do a very quick recap of what we just described, but now including some of the equations that demonstrate that our explanation is really not subject to interpretation, but that this is in fact how this problem should be analyzed under the framework of quantum mechanics. So, just like in the double set experiment, we start with a wave function of an equal superposition of the particle going through the top slit or the bottom slit. It is important to remember that these are not two separate photons, but a single particle in a superposition of going through each of the slits. So the different colors here denote different branches of the wave function. This is then followed by the generation of the pair of photons via spontaneous parametric down conversion, which are now described by the following maximally entangled state. Here the subscript S denotes the part of the wave function corresponding to the state of the screen photon, and the subscript I is used for the information photon. The screen photon is then directed towards D0. We can find an expression for the global wave function right before reaching the screen by representing the screen photon's state in its position space basis, and then evaluating the X coordinate at the location of the screen. And with this, we can compute the probability density of a photon hitting the screen by squaring the wave function, and then recognizing that since the purpose of the information photon is to identify which slit the source photon passed through, its corresponding states are orthogonal to each other, causing the cross terms in the probability density function to vanish. If we now assume we're dealing with plane waves reaching the screen, just like we did in the video for the double slit experiment, we get that the probability density is proportional to a constant value, which is indicative of no interference pattern irrespective of what we do with the information photon. And again, the reason we don't get a distribution proportional to the sum of two more localized functions is due to our plane wave assumption. Now, considering the scenario where the screen photon first gets localized at D0, we can calculate the probability of the source photon having passed through the top slit or the bottom slit by going back to our global wave function and evaluating the screen's y coordinate at some specific value y sub zero. Psi t sub s and psi b sub s are now just numbers that represent the probability amplitudes of having the particle go through the top slit or the bottom slit which then fully determine the probability of measuring the information photon at D4 or D3. For the particular case of assuming plane waves, the probabilities of measuring the photon hit D3 or D4 is always a half. In reality, this will obviously be different since the wave hitting the screen will probably be described by a more realistic wave function, like a Gaussian wave packet. 
So these probabilities will be described by expressions that vary as a function of y sub zero, but do not exhibit two slit interference. Now for the case where the information photon is sent to the eraser, the two branches of its wave function will be placed in an equal superposition of being sent to detectors D1 and D2, but with opposite relative faces. So, replacing these expressions in the global wave function and reorganizing shows that the probability amplitudes associated with the wave functions moving towards D1 and D2 are determined by the sum and the difference of the probability amplitudes associated with the location where the screen photon hits D0. These can then be used to determine the probabilities of measuring the information photon at D1 and D2, which again, under the assumption of dealing with plane waves at the screen, clearly shows that these probabilities depend on the cosine and sine squared of the location where the screen photon was detected in D0. Now, I understand this overview of the mathematics was a bit rushed, but the idea is to see that quantum mechanics perfectly predicts the outcome of this experiment without having to call for backwards in time communication. So, in the next video, we will show how we can map the delay choice quantum eraser onto a very simple quantum circuit, which as we will see, makes the analysis of this problem significantly more intuitive.